Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest talk. And this is going to be a series, I'll bet it's going to be a series of three talks on transitional cell carcinoma of the kidney, looking at many of the key facts, looking at pearls, and looking at many of the pitfalls. Now, when you look at how common cancers are, it's kind of interesting. When you look at the SEER data, which is probably the best place to get data, it's somewhat interesting, for example, in the fact that... Um, they really don't separate kidney and renal pelvis. They kind of put them together. About 79,000 new cases will be in this coming year, about 13,900 deaths. Kidney and renal pelvic cancer represent about 4% or 4.1% of all new cancer cases in the U.S. each year. Transitional cell uh, accounts for about 7% of all renal tumors. So it's only 7%. It accounts for about one of every 25 upper urinary tract tumors. They're curable in more than 90% of patients if they're superficial and refined to the renal pelvis or ureter. So you can see, like most cancers, early detection is really everything. Now, when you look at kidney cancer in general and you combine it with renal pelvic cancer, five-year survival is about 76.5%, and then no doubt is driven by many small renal cell carcinomas that are detected incidentally. Remember, about two-thirds of all renal cancers are picked up incidentally. Transitional cell can be picked up incidentally, particularly in the bladder. It can be picked up incidentally in the kidney as well, but probably more commonly is related to a patient who presents with something like hematuria. When you look at some of the numbers, uh, when you look at urothelial cancers in general, 90% are transitional cell carcinomas, 9% are squamous cell, and 1% are mucinous adenocarcinoma. So the significant majority are TCCs. The average age is the sixth to seventh decade of life. It's more common in men than women by about a three to one ratio. And one of the unusual and important things when you're evaluating for transitional cell carcinoma or staging transitional cell carcinoma or follow-up of transitional cell carcinoma is that 40% of patients with upper tract TCC will eventually develop other tumors in the lower tract. So if you have a patient who has a TCC, even a small one of the upper pole left kidney, they're going to do a nephrectomy, they're going to resect the ureter and a portion of the bladder because you want to prevent drop mets into the ureter or drop mets into the bladder. You still can see contralateral disease as well. When you do staging, people talk about staging as localized, regional, or metastatic. When you talk about localized, we talk about patients with localized disease divided into three. Group one have low-grade tumors confined to the urothelium without lamina propria invasion. G group two are grade one to three carcinomas without demonstrable subepithelial invasion or focal microscopic invasion or papillary carcinomas with carcinoma in situ and or cancer in situ elsewhere in the urothelium. So it's kind of early tumors. And grade three, although localized, are high-grade tumors that have infiltrated the renal pelvic wall or renal parenchyma or both, but remain confined to the kidney. Infiltration of muscle in the upper urinary tract may not be associated with as much potential for distant dissemination as it appears to be the case for bladder cancer. So again, group three is more aggressive, more extensive, but still considered localized. Regional is considered group four, extension of tumor beyond the renal pelvis or parenchyma, an invasion of the peripelvic or perirenal fat, the presence of lymph nodes, hilar vessels, and adjacent tissue involvement. Metastasis is obviously spread of the tumor to distant tissues, and TCC common will go to uh, liver, common will go to lung, and then will go to bone. Now, in terms of uh, looking at TCCs, there was a recent article that made the point uh, and looked at patterns of presentation, diagnostics, and treatment in patients with upper tract TCC. They did a multi-center trial. 2,380 patients over a five-year period from 101 centers in 29 countries. So a lot of different places. Patients were predominantly male, 70%. 
and 53% were past or present smokers. So smoking is an important uh, risk factor for TCC. The majority of patients, 58%, were evaluated because of symptoms, mainly macroscopic hematuria, and CT was the most common modality performed for evaluation. Our data is in line with the known epidemiologic characteristics of transitional cell. CT imaging is the recommended study of choice. More invasive studies like ureteroscopy can be done and sometimes are done, but most of the time uh, CT is the study of choice. Um, ureteroscopy can be used for biopsy or tissue confirmation. The major risk for urothelial carcinoma of the upper urinary tract as we said, 70% were male in that one study, so male, older patients, cigarette smoking and tobacco use, phenacetine abuse, exposure to certain chemicals and drugs such as cyclophosphamide, chronic hydronephrosis, and a history of prior or recurrent severe urinary tract infections. It's kind of interesting that patients with severe urinary tract infections or multiple infections or long-standing infections are more prone to developing TCC over time. Now, um, urothelial cancers occur more frequently in the extra-renal part of the renal pelvis, followed by the unfundibulocalocele region. When they manifest as an infiltrating pattern, urothelial carcinoma expands out of the renal pelvis into the parenchyma with distortion of the normal renal cortical medullary architecture with preservation of the reniform shape of the kidney, which is typically now what happens in TCC. So when I think about TCC versus RCC, RCC is masses. They may be small masses or larger masses. They may be vascular or hypovascular, but TCC is typically hypovascular and is infiltrating. TCC involves the calyces, the infundibulum, the pelvis. Renal cells can involve the pelvis, but that's when they're large and invasive. So one of the things we need to look at is the protocols for TCC. If you suspect that TCC, four phases are necessary. We do non-contrast looking for calcifications, or since we're looking at for a renal mass, we'll be looking at the density of a process. Arterial phase at about 30 seconds is good, particularly for vascular lesions. Also can give good vascular mapping of the renal artery and veins. Venous phase is ideal for looking at washout, and many tumors will show better on the venous phase rather than the arterial phase. And of course, the late phase fills in the calyces and collecting system, and that can be helpful surely with TCCs to make sure you're not dealing with multiple lesions that are present. And also, you're tracking the ureter and tracking the bladder. So again, multi-phase acquisition becomes very critical. One of the things we like to do also is hydrate the patient with a thousand cc's of water 20 to 30 minutes before. You want to make sure the bladder is distended. That helps you pick up small bladder cancers. You got to be careful because patients always say they want to go to the bathroom. So ask them if they can just hold it in for a little bit. Hydration is good for distending the bladder. Hydration is also good for decreasing the incidence of sin, contrast-induced nephropathy. And again, it helps us detect smaller tumors, whether it's in the bladder or sometimes potentially in the ureter. Now, from a protocol perspective, non-contrast scans are important because you're evaluating hematuria, and so you may not be able to tell if something was a high-density renal cyst or not. Arterial phase from diaphragm to symphysis, and venous phase through the kidneys, and then delayed phase from diaphragm to the symphysis. Again, you're trying to minimize radiation dose, so you might do four phases from diaphragm to symphysis in all patients. Here, the reason we do an arterial phase, we're looking for renal masses that are vascular. Also, most bladder tumors are hypervascular. And delayed phase, we really want to see the calyces. We want to look for leaks. Things like polynephritis show better in late phase. So all important things. We wrote this article a number of years ago talking about CT urography, um, that it was critical for looking and detecting TCC, but it was everything related to the protocol. That poor technique can create significant barriers to making a correct radiologic diagnosis, particularly given the uh, identification of subtle tumors can be impossible in the absence of good seal system distension and opacification. 
Also, standard axial image review may be sufficient in other parts of the abdomen and pelvis. I still think you always need multiplanar. But in looking at the collecting systems in ureters, it can be very problematic. You really need to be able to look at things at a minimum with multiplanar, but ideally with 3D. And when you talk about the calyces, you talk about the ureter, uh, using MIP becomes very, very important for picking up small tumors. In this article, Shiverman also made the point that um, it's very easy to miss lesions of the ureters, particularly when they're not large, so they're not obstructing. When you do the MIP, it's easy to follow the course of the ureter, and so if there is a filling defect or an obstructing lesion, it's going to be easy to see. So again, this ability to look at images in more than just the axial plane, but also when you're looking at the kidneys for TCC, and I will recommend that for any renal pathology, also look very much at the sliding MIPS. Now, as I mentioned, axials, multiplanar, and then 3D imaging is really the way to go. All become very, very important. And I'll just show you some examples, and I just picked a few cases to show you the importance of the simplest thing, which is reconstruction views. If you look at the axial images, if you look hard, there is thickening around the proximal uh, right, pr proximal left ureter. Okay, there is thickening there. But look how much more obvious it is on the coronal view. That was a TCC. You look at this case, only on the MIP coronals do you see the thinning of the calyx to the upper pole of the left kidney. You also see the soft tissue surrounding it, classic for a TCC. Or in this case, is this an understended pelvis? Well, you look at it, it something looks infiltrating, but surely on the coronal, it's really infiltration from the renal pelvis up into the collecting system. That's a TCC. You can see that TCCs very early on can be very easy to miss. If you don't have delayed scans, you're going to miss them because there's no hydronephrosis. If you don't give contrast, you're going to miss it because you're not going to see it. So again, these lesions are very subtle. I mentioned also, besides multiplanar 3D imaging, here's MIP and volume rendering, both showing you very nicely the kale seal systems, as well as the ureters, this lack of filling of the proximal right ureter due to peristalsis, typically. But look at here, look at this case. Look at the left ureter. You can see both ureters because they're opacified, but you see the left ureter, it looks smaller than the right, but then you notice there's soft tissue around it. When you look at that again, and you look at it with MIP, look how obvious it is. There's a several centimeter infiltrating tumor, which is narrowing the left ureter. Now, yes, you can look at the left ureter and say, could it be TB? TB can narrow the ureter, yes. Schistosomiasis can do it, yes. Radiation can do it, theoretically, yes, but then the ureter would be irregular. But when you see a process like this, this is an infiltrating TCC till proven otherwise. Just a really nice example showing you that information. Here it is again with some volume rendered images and then the coronal against the volume rendering. All three of them show a several centimeter segment of the ureter that's markedly narrowed and that's going to be a TCC. Now, some other things about C TCC. Clinical presentation, not surprising, is typically hematuria. Again, multifocal and the age range I mentioned before. Again, this article uh, by Rahman, failure to acquire the correct contrast enhancement phases or alternatively failure to adequately descend the collecting system can make identification of even large tumors difficult. A very important point. Now I will tell you this, put this slide in to remind me to mention, we don't do 10 minute delays, we don't do eight minutes, we do five. That works typically well in most cases. The reason I don't like delayed phases at eight or 10 minutes is the contrast often gets very dense in the calyces and the renal pelvis and then causes beam hardening artifact. And then you have a hard time seeing lesions that are present. So five minutes seems to be a very good compromise and that works really nicely. Now, as I mentioned, one of the things we always need to think about when we look at renal tumors or in a patient with hematuria is it is a tumor, okay, yes, but is it a TCC or an RCC? RCCs will vary in shape and size and vascularity. TCCs are typically hypovascular, typically arise in the renal pelvis or in the collecting system with amputation. They can be infiltrating in nature and simulate renal cell carcinoma at times. 
They can also simulate lymphoma, which can be focal. So again, it's something you need to think about in the differential diagnosis. So when we look at urothelial cancers, what do we think about? Single or multiple sessile filling defects that compress the renal, silence fat, renal sinus fat, pelvic seal irregularities, which are often strictures, focal or diffuse mural thickening, I showed you some cases a few moments ago, calyx seal amputation, and tumor-filled distended calyces. When you think about intrarenal TCC, most upper tract TCCs are small, superficial, and frond-like with good prognosis. A small minority are infiltrative and multifocal. Most common location is the renal pelvis due to the large area of urothelium, and there's a strong tendency for bilateral lesions and multifocal lesions. And again, the importance when staging or following is always look for multiple lesions to be present. Now, we mentioned some of the findings in terms of the calyces. You can see urothelial thick thickening and enhancement. You can see a focally amputated calyx. You can see a focally dilated calyx. You can see irregularity of a calyx and infiltration with a hypodense mass. The infiltration can even lead to renal vein thrombosis. Infiltration can make you think about the possibility of renal cell cancer or the possibility of lymphoma, but it's important to consider that still a good possibility for a TCC, though maybe not as classic as some others. Now, one of the things about uh, TCCs is, again, from a pitfall perspective, these lesions are often missed when they're small or don't cause too much irregularity in the kidney. You can see single or multiple sessile filling defects that compress the renal sinus fat. You can see pelvic seal irregularities, which is stricture-like, can easily be missed. Focal or diffuse mural thickening, again, if you're not careful, you can miss it. Kale seal amputation, when it's uh, a big calyx, it's easy to see. And then, of course, tumor-filled calyces, often dilated calyces due to strictures, uh, can be seen as well. So here's a good example. If you look at the left kidney, Enhancement is a bit less than the right, and then you look, there's something filling in the renal pelvis. So we're talking about a tumor in the renal pelvis, and in the coronal view, you could see it right here. It's filling in the renal pelvis, lower pole calyces, and that's a soft tissue mass. It could be sludge, unlikely. It's not going to be an RCC. It looks like a TCC. Soft tissue in the renal pelvis and here it is involving the renal pelvis and lower pole calyx. Interestingly, at this point, the kidney's function is still normal, 360 degrees. On closer to the, uh, a little bit later, you see very nicely the interface between the uh, urine and the patient's tumor in the left kidney in the renal pelvis. And on delayed phase imaging, you can see the, the tumor is more of a soft tissue mass. It's a bit more obvious and particularly nice look on the coronal view, that infiltration, involvement of the renal pelvis, and encasement of the lower pole calyx. Again, a few other images, just a very nice example of a infiltrating tumor with calyceal amputation and tumor extending from calyx into the renal pelvis. And here it is again, just a very nice example of what can, of what can happen and what you need to look for. And when you get to the delayed phase imaging, you can then see some of the contrast layering out. So that becomes very important as well. And this case really is a second case. Infiltration left renal pelvis has increased soft tissue density. Look at it on the coronal views. But then you see irregularity of the calyces. What are we dealing with here? Again, soft tissue mass, irregular calyces. This is a bit bulkier than the last one involving upper, middle, and lower pole calyces. Look at the distortion of the renal pelvis on the MIP. MIP is beautiful for showing you distortion. This is classic infiltrating transitional cell carcinoma, not anything else in the differential diagnosis. So what we'll do is let's look at a few more cases. But before we do, let's take a well-deserved break, get a snack, maybe a cookie, get some water, maybe some iced tea, and see you back here in five. Bye-bye. 
If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.